Everyone should have in front of you the biographies that of each panelist. So in interest of time, please simply let me signal that Professor Stephanie Golub, which is Associate Professor of Political Science here, who college was ex academic experience in like, international commerce in the region. And our friend Omar Ramirez Tejada, colleague, is a Minister of the Environment, which is, has studied urban planning and environmental law, and has been the Minister of the Environment and Advisor to the President of the Dominican Republic, and as the Minister, minister said, has been the Advisor to the President. And also our colleague and friend, Professor Washington Gonzalez. Um, he is a Professor of Law and works in the Autonomous University of Dominican Republic and has been also working in a lot of labor, labor led affairs and immigration affairs. So, we want to ask our panelists to start with a little discussion in your topic of interest. And I want to start with our colleague Omar, Ramirez Tejada, who can you ask you to talk to us a little bit about the processes and the challenges of integration in terms of environmental challenges, which is one of the biggest areas that affects the region. And as you know, when there's a cyclone or a, or a natural disaster, not only do you just dedicate to affect, it doesn't just affect one territory, but it sort of like it takes over the entire zone. So in turn, so in terms of preparedness and prevention, and also in terms of remediation, we should have a, a good discussion around the topic of the environment, which should be fundamental. And I also want to ask colleague Washington Rosales to talk to us a little about the topic of the work and security. And then asking Professor Golub to give us some initial commentary in terms of commerce. And then some questions to follow up. And then an opportunity for our colleagues in the public to make any questions they desire. So with any further ado, please, Omar Rivera. Good evening to everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here in New York, especially in this prestigious academy. I really want to thank all of the Dominican authorities that are here and also Senor Rahel and everyone, all the students who are here present in uh, act of solidarity with the Dominican Republic. So the first thing that I want to say is that the environmental topic is a topic that is imperative in the 21st century and is very much a topic that also has attracted great expectations in, in this era of knowledge. It's not a secret to anyone that the environment is a, it's a bull and it's a questioning element where all 195 states need to be concerned because the environment is in danger. And there is a million of national, international treaties and convenings that after the Second World War, to be specific, has been signed more than 48 treaties and international convenings within the mark of the United Nations here in New York. But I was telling uh, Ambassador Couturreal that I had the pleasure of, of being with him when the Dominican Republic on the 20, April 22nd of 2016 signed precisely the Paris Treaty that we never, that from Second World War up to now, no ju judicial instrument at an international level had been signed with so much seriousness that 178 parts did it in less than a month. And that says clearly that there is a will for the international community to protect the environment. And to, you know, and for this phenomenon of the 21st century, which is climate change. And climate change has already taken lives in our region. Just to give you some specific data, the World Bank published recently that in their work about the Caribbean, that in the last 10 years, 1.3 million Caribbean people have died, but not it seems that 4.4 million have been affected by climate displacement. About displacement, this is our expert right here in immigration. But it is important that you know that a lot of the fundamental causes in the Caribbean around displacement are not just economic displacement issues, but also from a environmental lens. And another important aspect that we need to highlight is that Caribbeans and Latin Americans are, we consider 
in this hemisphere that the atmosphere, the water, and all of the elements are a public good. It is a public good that everyone here has a right to use, to enjoy, and to make of it a sustainable use over time. That's why it's, as we consider, since we consider it a right, we need to do, we need to defend an, an effective protection of our natural resources in our region. That's why there has never been really resistance in the natural material in terms of nature. That's why I'm saying that you know, I want to talk about how Dominican Republic has played a role in this framework of integration. Uh, Latin America is strong Caribbean country and American. In, <coughs> in our hemisphere of 35 countries, basically the Dominican Republic has led it, as Minister Mejia has said, of integration and also the, integra the regional integration, Caribbean and Latin American as well. One of the elements that caused this integration was globalization, and globalization pushed our countries that we needed to have commonality and positions around these topics like atmosphere, the use of water, the use of natural resources, etc. For Latin America and the Caribbean, it is, up, it is obliged to develop coordinated responses within the states and within the actors that are within the states, which is a very important aspect of integration. Integration does not only happen between the states, but it helps and supports that within the states there are common positions in the different political actors. And that is something that for Dominican Republic has been a lesson, a learned lesson, that integration has helped to question our states, but also has helped us question the political class of those states that has, that has the responsibility to direct the destinies of those countries. I don't want to extend too much. I'm going to finish with a very important topic and aspect of this conversation and that I would like you to visualize very well. Well, in what sense? Our hemisphere, including the 35 states where North America, and in this case the United States of America and Canada, play a leading role that is very important is that our hemisphere reserves 33% of water production in the planet. This is the hemisphere that has the most, the widest forest land. It also has the most important resources in the country today, in the planet today. How do we administer them? How do we use them? In an intelligent way, it's a challenge. It's a hemisphere challenge. And it's a challenge that needs to be clear in terms of the, the understanding of the leadership of our countries. And in terms of the Treaty of Paris, even though the Trump administration announced their retreat from them, they haven't done it. And we expect, and we precisely expecting the feeling that there will be reflection about the Paris Treaty and that we're going to continue to move forward with this process, the slow but sustainable process that the gas emissions which, which reached more than 52 gigatons of our hemisphere. Our hemisphere has barely, in this case, with the United States and Canada, has achieved, has gone to 22%. If we take out the United States and Canada, Latin America and the Caribbean only have a carbon footprint of 9%. So, Latin America and the Caribbean is essentially a clean region in terms of gas emissions. But this is a, there's a very important case here to see. Out of the top 10 most vulnerable regions in the country, in the planet, five are in a region. And within those five, 
is the Republic of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. That's why, in terms of climate change, it is urgent that there be a global response so that this does not continue to affect precisely the most vulnerable countries, like Latin American Caribbean countries. I want to leave you here so that we can continue later. Thank you. Mario Gonzalez, if you can talk to us a little bit of how we work, integrational topics in terms of work and immigration, that we know it's a topic that is affecting the region in its totality. Can you please talk to us about the, your experience in the context of the Dominican Republic? Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. For me, in this stage, to talk about immigration and integration fills me with two big questions. The first one is, when you talk about integration and immigration, you necessarily, you know, according to the big theorists and the international organizations around migration, we need to talk about regular migration. And secondly, that around my country, we also have to talk about integration and immigration sometimes seems to be confusing with the part that's about fusion. So it's, it's two big challenges in the world where irregular immigration continues to rise and we put this in a stage that has to be a challenge. So I wouldn't want to scientifically talk about the topic, but we want, I want to present what has been our good practices in terms of integration and immigration. In the year 2013, the Dominican Republic president realized that it was necessary to confront a debt that our country was facing in order to talk about the immigration topic. And precisely, they were they brought about three fundamental topics. The first one was based on a reorientation of our migration policy to complete what is considered the national normativity. The second had to do with the labor-related migration processes, and the third one had to deal with uh, efficiency at the border. So, of course, the one that created the, most, the biggest uproar and the biggest expectation in the, pub in the public was the execution of the National Plan of Regularization of Foreigners. By a decree of 2013, the President of the Republic executed this plan. And the first thing that we did was the following. We talked with all of civil society that was interested in migration topics. Second, we talked with the international community, UN organizations, with migration, all of the embassies that were accredited in the country. And why not also with the UNICEF and present to them what we were trying to do with the regularization plan. We received their suggestions, we presented ours, and we initiated the process. The first inconvenience that we had was that a majority of immigrants that we had were from our neighboring country of Haiti. And we're not talking about a regularization of the migration, the conditions of migration, but of the documentation. Documentation. A country that and more than 80% did not have any national documentation. And that was the biggest challenge that we were trying to embark upon at that time. So then that cost the country $47 million, a poor country with difficulties. And the process was eminently free. And it was directed, as the as Minister Mejia told you, towards every foreigner that was present in the country, but noting that we're performing it in a regular way.
have all known that our country not, is not only a destination country, it's a transit, a heavily transited country. More than 1,800,000 Dominicans live, in the, live outside of DR. More than 5,800,000 foreigners pass through our country. <clears throat> and, they, and then we question how much of that amount of foreigners are living in the country. Some of them say that some say that it's two million, some say that it's two million four hundred thousand, some people say it's eight hundred thousand. In my country, in San Juan de la Maguada, which is close to the southern region, we say that we have to see it with a close eye, which means. That if in my neighborhood, when I wake up, I see a lot of foreigners, then I say that it's two million. If I see that there aren't that many foreigners, then I'll just say one million. And if I don't see any foreigners, then that must be 600,000. So then how do we even start a process when you can scientifically have a statistic that is clear about how many foreigners are in the country? So of course, if there's an irregular migratory condition, then you will never know. It's impossible to know. But you want to have a at least some step ahead of how many foreigners at least are present in the country. So when we, when we took on the, the survey of 2012 and started to work, let me just tell you that during the entire process, 288,000 foreigners participated. We hadn't even had the first experience of, of regularization of foreigners in the country. And in one year, we inscribed 288,000. And the most important part, they obtained documentation. More than 250,000 of them received documentation. Never in Latin America, had, or in the world maybe, in the, had there been a process of regularization in this proportion, with, of this quality and of this quantity. Well, we did that process of regularization, but there was a there was an external critique that was really big. What are you going to do with the folks that are born in the DR, that are par that are like that are the sons of foreign parents that have an irregular immigration, immigration story. And that's when the international community started to say that there was a process of de denationalizing folks. Well, even the president of the Dominican Republic made a second consult and consultation and submitted a, pro a law project to the Congress. Because this wasn't a, this was a state uh, concern, fundamentally, not a government concern. So they approved the law 169.14 that determined the following, which ended this topic. Firstly, all of those born in the Dominican Republic, which were the offspring of parents of irregular immigration, are not Dominicans, but do have permanent residency. That was the first thing. The second was that those, uh, those Dominicans born in the Dominican Republic Parents who were the offspring of foreign parents with an irregular migratory condition, but that were inscribed in the civil books, are Dominican by mistake. Because those people were not to blame that enough that a civil official had inscribed them irregularly. Because what would happen back in the day was that they would get written into the National Registry, but they were supposed to be written into the Foreigner Registry. But in that condition, there, were about, there was about 55,000 people. And of those 55,000 people, there have, been, there have been going through the Central Electorate, and they continue to preserve their status as Dominican. Of course, those 55,000 are not going to be that many. Some of them live in other countries, some of them died, etc. But that resolved a lot of the problems that were presented. Uh, those folks that said that that was a process, and it was a lie, and then at the end of that, the UVA and other national organizations have recognized 
that it was a good practice process around that can be recognized around the world. I don't want to end my intervention without first giving a little touch to the topic of integration and immigration itself. How? Do you integrate an immigrant to the culture, to the education, to the health, to the economy of a city, of a population of where they're not from? That is a very complicated thing, and even more so when, and I repeat, it's an, it's an immigration irregular process. It's a complicated process, and I want to give you three details to end this. More than 52,000 pre-college students and college students, mainly from Haitian origin, are in our universities and colleges, completely free schools. And also in college in the, old, in the last few years, in the Autonomous University of Santo Domingo, then we also have a big number of Haitian students. But more than 16% in their associations, and in others, more than 80% of the budget that is destined to help goes straight to Haitian nationals. The Dominican government admitted a resolution in which in all schools had to be inscribed and had to be present in the public hospitals, they had to receive any foreigners without asking if they had any documentation or not. So if you can see, this has been an example of integration and good practice amidst a situation like the one that we have on a migration level and the big problem we have with irregular immigration. I want to, you know, be able to keep talking about this topic with any questions you may have later on. Thank you so much. So in terms of the integration topic, we think about economic exchanges and commercial exchanges. Even though we know that some of the exchanges that happen in the region in terms of cultural and artistic exchanges, sports, institutional, and we also know that there's a multiplicity of contexts that are personal and familiar, but in the area of commerce and economy, uh, Professor Golub, can you talk to us about how, what is the, what is the hot topic in terms of commerce and economy in the Caribbean? Thank you, everyone, Hector, for this opportunity. Thank you. I'm very proud. It's a great honor to be with all of you today, ministers, and with all of you here in the room. I also want to recognize and, uh, my students who are here to also, that, you know, they inspire me every day to learn more about this hemisphere. Well, I'm going to give you a more global context because we are in the globalization era, but also we are in this moment where we are facing a lot of uncertainty in terms of the regime of institutions, in terms of com international commerce. And I also want to focus on the uncertainty that has happened with NAFTA that is also, well, in, in English, someone in the Boston Journal had called it USMACA. USMCA. You know, the, 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 new, the new iteration of the NAFTA deal. Is what I mean. So we're talking about the change in terms of both ideological and practical policies, commercial policies in the United States in terms of its, its neighbors, neighboring countries, and also in terms of the world. This is an administration that is transactional. And it's that, you know, they're open to negotiating, but what they want to negotiate is renegotiate treaties that are already formed and wants to also negotiate them in very bilateral terms. They seem to be allergic to multilateralism. They think, you know, 
I think they're right. I think that they have more of an advantage in the United States to negotiate in a bilateral environment. And that is something that America, Latin America knows. A lot of Latin American countries, and including DR and Mexico, which is even more, even Canada, are champions of the multilateral system in terms of politics, in terms of the United Nations as well, and also in the globalization of the global commerce. Because the countries in this region know very well the, they need to, you know, they know the divide and conquer strategy. It's very much easier to negotiate and have the upper hand when you are the bigger one in the, in the negotiation. So Trump or, and his electorate, we're talking about a president that wants to you know, fulfill his promises to his electorate, wants to renegotiate treaties in this way. So this is a problem that instead of just being transactional and bilateral, it's also, you know, the form in which they negotiated, you know, they're trying to create some sort of wheel where the U.S. is in the middle and then, then they have all of the other ones giving him, giving them some, and that's a big problem because we're also, you know, that's a big change and it's not a change of of other governments that don't won't, you know, won't want to get the U.S., don't have the U.S. in mind. But in the time of NAFTA, when NAFTA was signed in the 90s, they were also talking about an area of free commerce in the Americas, but that project also had United States in the middle of it. So in this moment, we have this uncertainty of also in the organization of world commerce, because in Trump's administration, they don't want to renew the mechanisms of of the disputes, which is a problem. You know, these are these are panels that resolve disputes, and you know, the multi multilateralism, commercial multilateralism, is facing on a certain period of time. So now we also talk about this hemisphere. We have Canada and Mexico that already have other agreements, but to still are imposing aranceles against. Uh, steel. So there are still problems with the U.S. and that front. We have Mercosur in South America, but Mercosur also has its own problems. We have the Venezuelan problem at this moment. So this hemisphere is, you know, it's, you have to look at it with some pessimism maybe. But from my point of view, it's also a moment of opportunity because there's a great history in this hemisphere of finding unity. Always, you know, it's a topic that comes back to us and comes back and comes back. But I think in this moment, even if we look at in the European Union problems of integration, you know, we have Brexit happening. And, and, you know, rejecting that idea of an, an economic integration, I think in this hemisphere, we have a great opportunity because the possibility of advancing in regions we've seen already with the area of Asia. Like, the Trump administration has, has separated from the Pacific Treaty, but other countries have advanced with the treaty, and they say, yeah, if you don't want with us, that's fine. We can do our own thing, right? So we're going to continue with that. And then I'm also thinking in this moment uh, about the United Front against not only the United States, but also most post more positively, like, like the minister was saying, in order to look for solutions to problems that we have in common in terms of the environment as well. And also thinking about what it would be to defy and national interest. And national interest. So we talk about in terms of the zero sum theory, right? Of thinking that relations with countries, because they have a national interest, it's a competition, and that also is seen in the strategy, in the national security strategies that Trump administration has presented that sees this environment, the international environment, as a chess game of some sort, as a game where one loses and one wins, right? That's the zero sum theory that I'm talking about and how the Trump administration has presented it. But has, as we've seen, 
in the OBC and other environments, there can be multiple wins, multiple winners. So that is also a challenge because globalization hasn't affected all countries in the same way and hasn't affected all the populations of those countries in the same way either. So then we have movements that are very strong within countries that see ex commercial exchange with, you know, very negative terms. So they see that they're losing, that they want the protection of their governments. So we see this Brazilian rhetoric where we see this rhetoric in other countries of also saying that we're, there are nationalist movements. So that's the, you know, the, the challenge. You know, we have common problems with them. But then personal interests divide us, and that's the problem. I think leadership, as we've seen in DR, in Dominican Republic, and other countries of this hemisphere, is very, very important because supremacy in this hemisphere, hemisphere has always been sacred in a way because of the threat of the United States. But what we've seen in, in terms of the European Union is that it's also possible, and I'm going to say this in English, es posible eh, escalar hacia arriba. If we're talking about cooperating, we can then confront the, the challenges of globalization. The big problem with the uncertainty in the United States is that a lot of countries in America Latina are looking for markets. And the United States is one of the nearest markets and most safest markets. But right now, it's not that safe. You have to look for other markets. And we're in Latin America, Europe, Asia, but also there's markets within the hemisphere. There's markets in countries of the hemisphere, and that's really important to innovate in this. And also negotiate and think about what's happening with other superpowers that are also active here in this hemisphere. Not only the United States that will always have its interests, but we also have China. We have China which is also looking for hegemony in their own region, but it's also looking for the natural resources of Latin America. How do you negotiate with China when China is extending these, lo these loans? That even that's its own way of acting. They have loans to give out and the initiative, the Belt Initiative, and it's also a type of, of circle with China in the middle. So that's sort of like, you know, the same as the U.S., a strategy that a lot of the superpowers are trying to do. So that's a big problem with China, maybe, and, and also thinking about the interest, the Russian interests is also a part of it. So I'm going to end here, and I also want to think about, invite you to think about, and maybe comment more with all of you, what would be the projects, what would be the common problems and the common opportunities for those in America Latina and Latin America to maybe finally, you know, what you call an idea that has arrived in this time, that it's going to be that moment of opportunity of saying, what can we do, what happening, what's happening with the United States and what's how do we take advantage of the power of integration that is present? Thank you for your attention. So when you go back home, I know that you're going to be anxious to maybe open the book to see in its totality. You're going to see that a lot of the topics that have been touched upon in an expert manner and in the complexity and maybe in a superficial way they are going to be you know discussed in a deeper way in this book what you have seen today has simply been a little taste of what the material you know not only theoretical but also statistical that is present in all the presentations that have been made today i know time is not on our side right now and i agree with professor Golub with other comments that our region um, with, with its diversity and its complexities and its problems, also as a magnet has always looked for the ways to integrate. Maybe we are blessed up to a certain point that a lot of the disputes in our country has have been executed in the baseball fields with or in the football field and not in the battleground. 
and we want to hope that in the future, given the tensions that exist in the region, with the leadership of people like Minister Mejia and others, we can really find the way to have an open dialogue, a more deeper dialogue, and to find our common problems. I'm going to take the chance to open for 30 seconds or one minute if there's any person that has a question that is burning and the question is screaming inside of you so much because we have no much time that if you don't do it right now you have our undivided attention and if you don't do it now you can't sleep so let's give a question of one or two questions and we can give the panelists a chance to give us a minute and then we can close the event with most kindly the young person right behind you right here and the gentleman over here two questions and we're done can you please stand up Hola. My name is Aline and my question is, before anything, I wanted to thank you all the panelists for this fantastic panel. I am not a student in the university, but I was interested in someone who the friend that recommended for me. He's from the, works in the UN and I'm happy that I came. I also wanted to say that I'm very moved to hear solidarity that you have with the Haitian people. Your great preoccupation for the environment, topic of environment and immigration, and irregular immigration, and also to hear Professor Golub about China's role in this. So I'm a Chinese citizen, and I've been in Latin America for five years. You know, I'm almost, and also in Dominican Republic. And I wanted to ask if any panelists, other panelists, have a Latin American lens of how they see the role of my country in your region. If you see it as a hegemony that wants to land as a trap or if you see it as a more benevolent role. <coughs> so yeah, let's take one more question and get the panelists. And I want to tell you that the ministry is going to have a, a, an answer to the question that she just asked about relationships between the Dominican Republic. If you can please come to the mic. Good evening, my name is Jose Padilla. I'd like to ask the Dr. Golub if the United States, if the United States has forgotten about its country, or it's the bottom Latin America, and if this would be the precise moment to give us more opportunity to integrate and more importance and integration to the region, have you noticed that the, re the most important regions? Uh, the, you know, do you think this is the right time to pay attention to how important the region is in terms of integration? <coughs> you can say that well. um, no, yo puedo hacerlo, pero si, yeah. What are the stresses on the de development of a democracy? in the Dominican Republic because of all these integrations and relationships with other countries with so there are sometimes win-win, sometimes win-lose. Uh, we see a lot of that obviously in the United States. Talking about internal stressors. Internal stresses brought on by this integration. ¿Cuáles son los tipos de estreses internos que ocurren dado al proceso de integración con inmigración irregular y con la interacción con otros países. So let's give a chance to each of the panelists and some of the ministries about to respond the best way that they can and to also finish with a comment, precise commentary if you want. So I want to start answering the question of that young woman. You know, um, I am, I've been a follower of Jose Martí Poso de Cuba, who says that when that I want to, you know, answer to the voice of the youth in responding to your question about the role of China, and it's you know it's a it's an emerging economy, not so much emerging, it's very mature at this point, and above all with everything that has to do with its expansion, economic expansion, and in terms of. I, 
you know, in terms of environmental topics, paradoxically, a country that depended on a 70% of carbon and fossil fuels has, has, is actually now doing the most powerful energy revolution in the framework of what is globalization. And that is a possible reality. In terms of, in economic terms, Latin America and the Caribbean is interested in it's, be, it's a topic of interest for China and hegemonic countries in terms of the resources that those superpowers need, that the country needs. Of course, America Latina and the Caribbean were not on the hegemonic maps. Now, yeah, it still isn't really. And I can dare say that if, if Latin America doesn't coordinate itself, then it will have to accept the rules that China and the U.S. implements. And I feel like as very much. As Hector has said, in the unity of the diversity that we have in Latin America and the Caribbean, and in this interesting strength, that's where our position lies when facing China and the United States. <coughs> I think there's two fundamental aspects that we had to confront um, at an internal level. The first one was a very reduced group that defended our, like, strongly the, the topic of nationalism, a very complex topic. And the second tension was also another small group that was denominated, quote unquote, pro-defenders of Asian nationals. So maybe it was, that was the biggest thing, it was the biggest difficulty because we had to go throughout the entire country, we had to walk and explain where we were headed, listen to the population. And then, you know, there was, there, we were starting to develop a strategy of what we wanted to really do. And that was one of the biggest challenges. And, you know, it had to fundamentally do with us being a poor country. So then there was an international community, but that also transferred to the Dominican Republic that understood that Dominican Republic had to carry with a problem but the content of the problem that didn't necessarily, that wasn't a problem for, by a, a Dominican Republic's problem, it just was a problem that was on an international level very much our own. And that was one of the biggest obstacles that we had, tensions that we had during the whole process. But thank you to all the integration of the population itself, we were able to resolve it on some levels. And it's not that it's completely gone, but now there is a less, a lesser proportion of that problem exists at this moment. Thank you. The question about intentions of China is possible that they are, you know, depends on the perspective, right, of the benefits, right? Because exchange with a powerful country, you know, the symmetry has benefits, but it also has a double-edged sword when you're having negotiations with a powerful country and continent. In Latin America, it's interesting that, you know, they have their own interests as Latin American countries in being in that relationship, but, you know, to take advantage of the benefits of the exchange, of the commercial exchange, of the investment, because China does have a lot of resources, and the Chinese government also is looking for an image to develop an image in the world, to develop a presence, and also a type of, of, of profile in the world. But there are also problems, you know, how do you do this? But also understood the ter understand the terms of the exchange in order to reduce dependence, because you know it would be a big mistake and also a loss of an opportunity of inter of exchanging one type of dependency for another type of dependency. And it's not just to say that it's inevitable. And I'm also saying that you know, following all the topics over here, it's talking about pol political will. Is there a political will from the governments of these countries to really try to to negotiate rules or, or treaties and to do it from a, a strong position? I'm sorry that my intervention is getting extended, but for the other question, 
Sometimes the problems of stressors is United States made. When the United States is putting attention on America Latina, they're intervening, right? And yeah, from my point of view, I feel like you know, it is a time for my government or the government of my country to recognize the, the value of this hemisphere and that continent of Latin America and the Caribbean. But also also be careful of what it wants because maybe it receives it and it's also creates another tension where the US thinks that they can manipulate certain things or or you know bring about tensions in domestic policies and that might be a bigger problem with inter-American relations. So I'm, you're saying that there might be a bigger problem in the United States not paying attention? The problem would be that they're just intervening, right? And I just wanted to clarify that for you. Minister, if you have anything, any other comments for the panel? Well, before closing comments, I wanted to thank the space and all the folks that spoke here from Dominican Republic that have been here with us. Roberto Hernanimo, who's here. Hernanimo Cho. To Frederick Martinez, uh, emblematic figure of the Dominican Republic. Santiago Pito Acevedo, who's here also from the Republic of Bonao, and Manuel Ruiz from Telemiclo. Survivor, thank you for that your health has improved, brother. <laughs> I think that what guarantees peace in the world is invoking the thoughts of Benito Juarez in terms of peace. The respect to individual right is peace. Each nation within a, so a supremacy framework takes decision, even if they're wrong, is a right that is given to that nation, that belongs to that nation. If another nation tries to intervene in, its in those uh, matters, that politically has a name and it's called ingenuity. And when that occurs, then we have conflicts because there isn't a respect to individual rights. In the case of us as the Dominican Republic, we are an independent country ever since 1984, and we have an altar, a pedestal, we have a pedestal of these three men that give us freedom, from Pablo Duarte, Francisco Rosario Sanchez, and Ramon Matia Meja. And we, read our, we control ourselves by a country um, that is also developing by in the way that we synthesize this by a constitution we call Carta Magna, the, the will of the Republic. If we act according to the Carta Magna, to that constitution, our country does not ask for it. You know, they ask us to provide explanation. Our laws require explanation. We try to act within the rules of that constitution, our constitution, not another one. And the topic of China, we did it within our framework of being an independent country. That is a decision that a president had the right to make without consulting any statement of the Dominican state. Because our constitution gives unilateral powers to the president to take that step. And that's what he did. So then it was within the framework of the But I wanted to say, for those of you who know me, they know my sympathy for historical reasons with China. But I also have to say that that decision was made not inspired in the martyrdom rules or the, the bottom of the Sertone. We took the decision in terms of our needs and our convenience. A market of 1,300 million inhabitants in a that has seen certain things vanish and break. We, you know, as Dominicans say, 
Well, we said, wow, we had to make something out of nothing to survive in the middle of failure of the economic model that we had because we have a responsibility to our citizens. And it's from there that our government started to diversify its, well, its internal policies to, to access a new market that for us was a virgin market. And for that market, we could access to Dominican Republic. And within them is China, there's Vietnam, and there's other countries as well. When I went there for the first time on an official mission to Vietnam, I found that the embassy of the United States of America was a fighter pilot of the war that had been a prisoner of war. He was the embassy of the North American representative. So there wasn't a historical resentment for the past, but a need of mutual convenience. And that was being manifested with the Vietnam folks and North Americans and the, and the policy of harmony, harmony in tune with the needs of the current time and the current climate. So what we have done in China has been about need and convenience, but the importance of the market and for the development that they've had, but always within a framework of being an independent country as the Dominican Republic. Thank you so much. And I've taken thanks. I also wanted to mention one person here that we have integrated here, that is North American, is a scientist, one of the three best urologists in the world, and he invented the, the robotic surgeon, urology head of orbital here in the United States, and he introduced robotic operation here in the Dominican Republic. It was a great labor in society, and we want to recognize this type of training that has been given by, you know, our president has given the Dominican nationality to the doctor that is not that he requests it. So in terms of the middle of the community, we want to welcome, we want to welcome him to our nationality and to help us, you know, for him to keep contributing not only to us Dominican people, but to humanity with the knowledge and, you know, the, the effort that you've put towards the service of humanity that you provide. Thank you so much for accepting our nationality. I also want to recognize oh, Go ahead. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. My name is Dr. David Samadhi. Um, as you heard, I'm a urologist and I'm also one of the pioneers in robotic surgery. Um, it's a very interesting time for me to be here among you because uh, I'm 52 years old and I've been in America for about 37 years. And probably uh, Minister Mejia may or may not know this story, but I came to America when I was 15 years old with my younger brother who was 12. And we had a very, very comfortable life back at home in Iran as Persian Jews. I grew up in a Muslim country, and I went to all-boys Catholic school at Don Bosco in Iran. So I had a very interesting upbringing. But life changed, and revolution happened, and we had to leave everything behind. And it's a story of emigrant, and I, I'm so happy to hear about the immigration and bringing this global <coughs> view, uh, listening to everyone here. I came here about 37 years ago, and with $300, in our pocket. It's a long story, but I can tell you that this country has been tremendous to my family, hard work, and all the doors were open. And uh, today, I'm in a position to save lives. I can tell you that as a result of friendship, uh, such as Minister Mejia and a lot of the Dominicans, I think this culture is very similar to mine. They're warm, uh, open heart, friendly, if you're in, you're in for life. Uh, and as a result of this, I met so many uh, wonderful people, uh, Ambassador uh, Carlos Castillo, and the names are, goes on forever, and including the president, who really welcomed me to the country. We have a tremendous opportunity here, and I think America is going through a lot of changes. Uh, I 
just heard one of my patients who was in my office, a Mexican, illegal Mexican patient who had some urologic issue. And I like the stories. The urology part of it is easy, but I heard about how did you get here? And he said he went through the border three times. He got arrested and he spent two months in jail. He was so happy to be here and work in this country. It's not as, it, as easy as it used to be when I came to this country. Putting politics aside, right or left, we're not going to get into this, but I think this is a tremendous opportunity for Dominican Republic. There are a lot of people, there are a lot of Somalis out there who may or may not be able to come to this country, and I think we should try to open the door. We should perhaps change some of the regulations, make it safe, but open the door to a lot of physicians, scientists, uh, businessmen, really bring them to Dominican Republic. And certainly, as a new member of the country, if there's anything I can do, I will do everything I can to my power to make Dominican Republic uh, successful. Thank you very much. Definitely, and it's um, something that immigration has shown in the United States as well within different countries. It's not only a relationship on a national level, but it becomes a quotidian personal relationship. I was also trying to comment that I didn't want to let go of the fact that this is a country adopted to one of our nationals, with Maria de Hostos. With Part of our MFA, we have a concentration in atmospheric studies. We have we're lucky to be in the city of New York, not because we are we can you know intrude on anyone else's way of doing things in the world, but because historically we have been we have been given representation and one just representation of all the region of the countries in the North American region. So it's a certainly excellent space to learn as we've done today. We wanna to welcome you to we thank you for teaching us about your work and your experience. The city of New York has been enriched by the administration and even by the influence of countries like Colombia, Ecuador and Peru who send quality of immigrants, the quality of immigrants to the city of New York, even with Los Angeles, Miami, Houston, Chicago. New York has become every day a Latino city, a Latin American city, a Caribbean city. And Latinidad in New York has a very Boricua flavor and a Dominican flavor to it. And there's very many communities that meet at these crossroads. And these are some of these moments where we see those paths crossed that we've been discussing tonight. It is a region with great diversity, as we said, but also with very many challenges. And I am very happy to sometimes, you know, wake up and think, or no, what would have happened if Simon Bolivar and other liberators of Latin America and integration, regional integration would be happening in the streets of Manhattan, in the streets of Queens, in the streets of Brooklyn, when citizens from the countries of those regions and the quotidianness of their living are getting together, talking and learning, share and even marry and have kids, right, within the communities. Who would have thought that the 13% of Hispanics in the United States have parents that were born in two different countries? It's two countries, it doesn't matter what countries that were born in the U.S., the parents were Dominican and Puerto Rico, and they were in the same country, but they're two nationalities, right? So we are part of that big experiment. Like my grandma used to say, juntos pero no revueltos, we're together but not messy together. And I think that's part of that mosaic. And I thank you, Minister, your efforts in terms of the region and the leadership of the Dominican Republic in trying to always maintain us, you know, maintain that north of unity, comprehension, and dialogue. We I want to thank you so much all for taking time to come, your valuable time to come here and be here with us. We are a public university of New York. We are your college. And thank you so much for being here. And please demand and ask more opportunities so that our institution can respond to the interests of your communities. This is your home. Thank you and good night.